Let's call to order the February 8th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Mayor Brown, are we going to do the closed session report? Right. Is a part of that right or the closed session agenda? Oh, my apologies. Can we get a report on closed session? The council met in closed session this evening and took no reportable action. All right. So we can move forward with you. Okay. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Member Clark. Here. Council Member Morgan. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. And Mayor Brown. Here. Uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll move on to item two. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes this evening. Okay, moving on to item three. We've got some presentations this evening. Our presentations are limited to eight minutes, and we'll start with item 3A, a presentation from Capitola Recreation Division on the Recreation Strategic Plan. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I am here along with my staff to do a report out on the Recreation Division Strategic Plan. Next slide, please. All right. So the Recreation Strategic Plan was adopted at the first year of, or for its first year at um, fiscal year 2021. Um, so we are entering into our fifth year of that strategic plan. It um, had created a road, roadmap for us uh, that, that's, that comprised of a framework, three key initiatives, and four goals. Um, each one of those goals had three to five strategies in order to lead to accomplishment. Um, now, the pandemic um, adjusted a lot of those strategies, particularly years for achievement and um, some of the overall goal or aspects of the strategies. But ultimately, the pandemic also provided us a lot of opportunities um, for growth. Will you go to the next slide, please? So I do want to note that in your packet what is the entire adopted strategic plan. And I'm going to just kind of quickly go through some of the key points um, in, in order to spend more time on the good stuff that y'all actually want to hear about. So the strategic plan uh, consisted of a mission, a vision, and our values. Next slide, please. And then the first goal, uh, to become an efficient and effective umbrella organization. Next slide, please. A second goal in order uh, was to be more affordable and accessible in our programs and provide those services to the community. To maximize our facilities, both the park facilities and the buildings that we have available and to really um, use the partnerships that we have in order to broaden our reach um, to the residents. All right, and so each one of my, myself and each one of our st my staff, um, we're all going to go through the areas that we kind of oversee in the division and um, talk about kind of where we were before we adopted this strategic plan and where our progress has come to during this time. Um, so to start off with, um, as where's that little box? Sorry. Um, to start off with, the before the strategic plan started, uh, the community center definitely had some needs that it needed to attend uh, that we needed to attend to. It also we had a lot of standalone programs that didn't necessarily connect out within the community. And the staff structure um, really provided a limited opportunity for program development. 
Um, as time went on, we began to connect a little bit more with the Art and Cultural Commission. Um, the pandemic provided us our first opportunity to partner with them when we were offered the Reflections of 2020 Art Contest. Um, we also, at that time, was doing um, multiple levels of sponsorship where several staff were reaching out for sponsorship. We have since coordinated that uh, within the division and also our events and program calendar for the community offerings. And um, further developed our recreation coordinator roles in order to try and um, get to a more streamlined organization. One of the key initiatives that um, we have achieved is the addition of Kelly Barreto to the Recreation Division um, as I took on staff role for the Art and Cultural Commission. Um, and then throughout the city, as well as with support of council, we are addressing the community center needs, having established a new MOU, um, the fundraising campaign for Treasure Cove at Jane Street Park is well on its way. And um, along with city staff, council will be hearing more in the future about our special event permit review. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to my staff. Sorry, I need to adjust this. Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, mayor and council members. My name is Casey Anderson, and I supervise classes, community center rentals, and promotions for Capitola Recreation. So when this strategic plan started, um, Capitola Recreation had adult classes mainly on the weekdays. We had occasional community center rentals when staff um, availability permitted. We had an old recreation logo, which you can see at the top of the slide. Um, and we produced seasonal recreation catalogs. In 2020, as everyone knows, the pandemic stopped everything. Um, and that was the same case with Capitola Recreation. Everything that we had going on at the time, we had to figure out a way to do it different. So we figured out how to create all of our um, classes that we had going on into a Zoom model. This required a lot of technological tech support um, and helping people figure out not only how to use Zoom, but also just basic computer stuff. Um, to do this, we formed a virtual recreation center. This was the hub for all of our virtual classes, as well as we really realized that we needed to build our social media to be able to connect with our community. We began in-house graphic design um, and we began supporting citywide events once um, the pandemic ended and during fall of 2021 we were able to bring back in-person classes. This brings us to today where we now um, still produce a seasonal recreation catalog. It is sent to 30,000 houses in our community. Um, this catalog now supports all citywide activity, um, not just city um, department activity, but also partnered organizations. Um, we have very recent, in the past couple of years, we have brought on youth classes in addition to adult classes that we now are able to schedule seven days a week. Um, in addition to this um, availability in the community center, we now have a community focused rental schedule, um, meaning that whenever we have a rental request, we make sure that we have staff in there to provide excellent community service to the people that are renting the building. Um, in addition to all of this, we have focused on increasing collaborations within our county. We currently partner with the city of Santa Cruz, um, the city of Watsonville, as well as county parks and recreation, um, specifically for Parks and Recreation Month, which is in July. So July is Parks and Recreation Month. Um, this past summer, we joined all together and produced a citywide, or not citywide, a countywide um, ad that 
advertised all of the different recreation offerings that were happening in July, as well as advertised the Free Family Fun Day, which is the last Saturday of every July. Um, and it's a free activity for all families in our county to go to. In addition to collaborating with um, local parks and rec agencies, we have also moved to collaborating with parks and rec uh, professionals from all over the, um, the state. We have become a CPRS, California Parks and Recreation Society, membered agency. We currently have two district board members. Nikki is the president-elect of that board, and I currently serve as the secretary. Um, CPRS has become a great way for all of us to stay in con contact with the people that are doing the same things as us around the state, as well as provide multiple educational opportunities for us throughout the year. So yeah, I am very excited to share all the growth that we've had in these areas, and I'll pass it along to my coworker, Stacy. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am Stacy Butcher, I'm the Recreation Coordinator. I supervise youth programs and small events. Um, I've been a part of this strategic plan process since the beginning, and we're gonna start by talking about the OST program. The Out of School Time program was a distant learning program created during COVID the pandemic. It was created for kindergarten through eighth grade. We were able to put together seven different pods of students and put them on four different locations, campuses around the community. Um, this group of students rolled through and did an uh, off-site Camp Capitola for elementary school students that summer. Um, Camp Capitola, beginning, as a, beginning of this process, we had about 400 campers for six to 12 year olds. Um, we were able to able to obtain our ACA accreditation, and then we have since maintained that. Um, we've also been able to grow Camp Capitola to 670 this past summer. And um, we've added four and five-year-olds and also added a couple sessions of 11 to 14-year-olds. Camp Capitola also offers a junior leader program. Um, this is a fo focused on professional development for 14 to 17-year-olds. Um, the beginning of this process, we had about 15 enrolled. This past summer, we had 30 enrolled. Once camp's all done, we roll right into after school rec club at New Brighton Middle School. Mm -hmm. The beginning of the strategic plan process, it was a small group of middle school students only, about 12 of them. We used one room. Currently, we've increased our enrichment programs with the after school rec program, and we have about 30 students, and we do a transportation of 24 or so students. We go to SoCal Elementary and Main Street Elementary and drive them over to Brighton, and then we run two classrooms in the afternoon um, throughout the school year. When after school ends and the school break, schools have a break, we just started up this past holiday season and ran a school break camp. Um, this was extremely successful. We had a wait list for it, and so now we've seen the need in the community. We'll continue to grow that program. We cannot do any of this without our seasonal staff. So the beginning of the strategic plan process, we had about 10 summer staff and then four would stay on board. With growing of our programs, we have about 20 summer staff that work with Camp Capitola and eight stay on board and help us with the events and after school rec programs. Um, we are extremely thankful for the relationship we have with the Capitola Foundation. They play a key role in accepting the scholarship applications and awarding the appropriate funds to individuals. The beginning of this process, we had about four or five thousand to give to Cap Campitola participants or junior guards. We've extend we have since expanded this to all youth programs. It could be youth classes, youth camps, or youth um, guards in camp throughout the summer. This scholarship fund has grown to sixty thousand um, dollars. We are very thankful for the SoCal Unified Elementary School District grant, the Capitola Foundation, RRM, Go Kids. And also the City Council approved ECYP fund. Moving right along, in the beginning of this program, the strategic plan, we met with the library staff and realized the best way we could get the youth involved is taking field trips over to the library with their camp Capitola campers and also our after school rec students. Um, we've also started the food truck events during this process. We run four summer food truck events over at Monterey Avenue Park. We have live music, um, nonprofits run the beer garden, family fun games. Um, 
And we've also been able to offer winter movies at Capitol Community Center, um, and then monthly parent night out events. I am thrilled to be a part of the city and the recreation team. I'm honored to introduce Brennan Howard. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm going to highlight what my job is, which is supervising both the lifeguard service as well as the junior guard program, and just take you through kind of where we started and where we are as of now. So as you see, um, where we started, we used to have only one seasonal admin staff in charge of around 20 instructors. Um, every single time that we had to get these instructors certified, we would contract that to Central Fire Department, and they would give us an aquatic rescue response team certification, which is obviously slightly different than a lifeguard cert. For our tower operations, they were given to Santa Cruz Fire as under contract as well. We would still assist as much as we could with whether it's rescues, preventatives that we've gone over, but generally speaking, it was fairly low impact. We would only serve around 1,500 members of the community every year. As COVID hit, we bumped up our admin staffing to two seasonals, which would be in charge of the JG program as well as assisting all those instructors, and went as low as 11 instructors. Um, we would also still contract all of our training out, and at the worst case scenario, our beaches were closed entirely public use. Um, our collaboration and partnership did gradually change, however. We were able to partner with Santa Cruz Fire and do ride-alongs, but underneath that certification, we weren't actually allowed to run towers. Um, now, we have one full-time staff, which is myself, and I have three other seasonal employees that help me supervise the beach seven days a week during summertime. We have around 32 lifeguards, and all these lifeguards are certified in-house by the city. We also then get to operate our towers, which we hold so dearly. That collaboration and partnership that we've established has expanded significantly to encompass national standards with the USLA, the California Surf Life Saving Association, as well as our local like agencies, and even the Coast Guard stations up here with Sector San Francisco. Just last year alone, we served over 8,000 members of the community, whether it was small acts of kindness or doing major medicals and saving people's lives. Next slide. For Capitol Junior Guards, we had a similar arc. We typically would hold around 1,000 participants, and it was a fairly sports-oriented program. Um, our collaboration really just sat with Parents Club, and they held our hand through this whole process. They've really been driven in making sure this stays afloat. And as Stacy touched, we would assist with scholarships. During COVID, that dropped as low as 400 participants, and it allowed us to shift our curriculum to be more dual purpose, building job skills as well as life-saving techniques within our youth. And once again, Parents Club was there. Now we're back up at 1,000 participants, and our job skills and life-saving education have gone up even more. We're now certifying almost all of our AA's and CPR, as well as really getting them in the recruitment process, whether it's for a life-saving skill that they're gonna learn or just being a good member of the community. Um, our collaboration has also expanded, once again, using the USLA and the CSLSA and all of our local JG programs. Um, for community outreach, as you may know, we're doing the Equity Swim program, which allows us to help youth that might not be able to afford it or don't have the necessary skills to be able to enroll in the junior guard program, allowing us to really get that niche community that we need to help that ability to enroll. And then one more thing I would like to highlight too is Corey McNair, he's in the back. He has helped all of us throughout this entire process, whether you are renting from the community center or helping me through scheduling, or just the most minute things from all the graphics you've seen this entire night. Thank you. All right, so what's left for 
um, this last year within our uh, strategic plan. So we do have two key initiatives. Um, the first one is that to incorporate parks um, under uh, the programming of parks underneath recreation. Um, uh, Council will be hearing in, shortly in the future a uh, parks permit plan. Uh, we have another key initiative, which is to streamline um, the staff organization or the staffing structure in order to be a efficient and sustainable staff structure. And then finally, to identify opportunities um, with the upcoming city's strategic plan. So with that, we are available for questions. Great, thank you. Questions? All right, no questions. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate your hard work. All right, we're gonna go to item 3B, presentation from the police department on the police chief's advisory committee. Hello, good evening, mayor and council. <clears throat> I'm here this evening to report back to the council on the second recruitment of our chief's advisory group. Um, provide a little background on uh, the timeline of this, the Chiefs Advisory Group. So <clears throat> the goal was developed um, back last year, the late last year. Um, we developed uh, the policy, did some research, developed the policy application process, and started our first round of recruitment. Um, that first round of recruitment was October of 2023. We received, um, I believe we received more than that. We received about 11 applications. And, uh, no, I'm sorry. We received the eight applications. I'm sorry. And then... Um, we realized with that the demographics of that of those applications we wanted to get back out there and do some more research so we did that with the help of city staff we were able to take the brochure and make it bilingual um, and then we did a recruitment effort i'll kind of highlight the, the steps that we took basically from um, up until this last month and we held um, interviews i've received a total of both rounds about 20 applications um, next slide uh, so this is the, uh, like I said, the recruitment effort. So we did another two months. Uh, we broadened the scope as, as, at your direction. We reached out to Capitola, Live Oak, Soquel, um, Aptos, translated the um, applications into both English and Spanish, uh, made it available on the city website, um, and then put the information out to the city buildings, kiosks, um, the libraries, local uh, mobile home parks. Next. And then we also made direct uh, uh, communication with the Diversity Center, Santa Cruz Senior Center, uh, NAACP, Cabrillo College, some faith-based organizations, and those other groups. Um, and with that, um, I was able to sit down, actually myself and the captains were able to sit down and interview everyone. And at the end of those interviews, um, I landed on the list that's, that's before you. Um, as we did kind of reflect on the current list that's in, in front of you, we did recognize that we did still have some voids there, that we're going to continue to do some outreach there. Um, I also understand that, th that this, this group here, like I said, we're going to meet and we'll have to see how that works out. If, if, if a member were to fall off or if we were to find someone that, that meets the, our, our Spanish speaking community, I'd be more than happy to kind of bring them in as a part of that community just so we're encompassing um, everyone. Um, everyone's voice in this group. And so with that, like I said, um, your direction was to go out and do some more re, uh, recruitment, come up with a list and bring it back to you. I'm, I feel very, if you want to go back to that list, I feel very, very happy with the list that, we're, that we've landed on. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with each and every one of these, uh, these people and think that we're going to produce some really good co content out of this committee. So with that, I'm open for any questions or if you have any other feedback for me. Great, thank you. Yeah. Questions on this end? No questions? Questions on this? No? Comments? I'll just say thank you for bringing this back, and it's kind of cool to see that we got a lot more applicants once we sort of broadened the outreach a little bit, so I'm really happy that it went this way, so thank you for doing it. Thank you, and I do appreciate the feedback, and I really this second round, I feel so much better with this group. Um, not that the second, the first group was was lacking, but I feel like we've just covered a lot more bases here. So I really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your work on this. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll move on to presentation uh, C3, presentation from the Regional Transportation Commission providing an update on the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Hi, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, council members and Chair Brown. My name is Grace Blakesley. I'm a transportation planner with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. I was most recently before you in October to provide information about the Coastal Rail Trail Project segments 10 and 11, and it's good to be back to provide an update on the Zero Emission Passenger Rail Transit Program. I'm sorry, pass Passenger Rail and Trail Project. I'll first provide you with some brief background on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and its context within Santa Cruz County. Uh, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line is a continuous transportation corridor that spans approximately 32 miles from the computer community of Pajaro in the south to the northern community of Davenport. The branch line has been used since the mid-1870s with current freight and passenger excursion services. It provides the, the community uh, a unique opportunity to meet some of the transportation needs in Santa Cruz County. With this vision in mind, the Commission purchased the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line in 2012 and brought it into public ownership. And over the course of the next decade, the Commission contemplated several planning studies, including the 2015 Rail Transit Feasibility Study, which analyzed a range of public transportation service options using the publicly owned branch line. And later, the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis and Rail Network Integration Study, which was completed in 2021 which identified electric passenger rail as the preferred alternative that provides the greatest benefit to the county. Not listed here, um, also as completed as the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Plan that was completed in 2013 that relates to the use of the Santa Cruz Branch Line as a corridor for um, active transportation, multi-use bicycle and pedestrian path. In 2022, the Regional Transportation Commission directed staff to solicit proposals to develop a project concept report and environmental documentation for rail on 22 of the miles of the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, as well as contemplate developing the remaining segments of the Coastal Rail Trail between Santa Cruz and Pajaro. Currently, 17 miles of the Coastal Rail Trail projects have been constructed or are under development as separate projects, and the Zero Emission Passenger Rail and Trail Project would work to complete the 13 miles that have not begun, um, have not begun pre-construction activities and that segment is from Rio Del Mar down to Watsonville and Pajaro. The project development team, which consists of the consultant team and staff from the cities of Watson, Watsonville, Capitola as well, Santa Cruz and the County of Santa Cruz, as well as the transportation agency for Monterey County and the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District and RTC have supported development of a preliminary purpose and need statement over the last two months. Next slide, project overview. Uh, the zero emission passenger rail and trail project proposes a new high capacity passenger rail service and stations on those approximately 22 miles of the Santa Cruz branch rail line that is shown on this slide from Santa Cruz to Pajaro. The, as I mentioned before, it also proposes to construct the 12 miles of coastal rail trail, which is shown in green um, on this slide, beginning from Rio Del Mar connecting down to Pajaro. The project aims to take advantage of the publicly owned right-of-way to provide the passenger, oh, sorry, excuse me. Oh, this also to connect, excuse me, the point I wanna make here is that the passenger rail project is intended to connect to Pajaro with the state rail system. Rail passengers will be able to bypass Highway 1 and local arterials that are highly congested and provide high quality connections to key destinations within the county. The coastal rail trail component of the project will provide that dedicated and continuous bicycle and pedestrian facility. So the project concept report will look at conceptual rail transit vehicle technology, transit ridership, revenue forecasts, it will evaluate infrastructure, it will look conduct a rail corridor safety assessment, and in the end we'll identify multiple concepts and refine those concepts into one preferred rail transit and trail build concept that clearly defines the project for the next stage of project development, which would be the environmental analysis stage. Next slide. Here's the project set schedule. Uh, the project concept report is anticipated to be completed in spring 2025. And following the completion of the project concept report, the project will move through preliminary air engineering, and as I mentioned, environmental documentation, and then after that, project approval and right of way and final design. 
Next slide, please. So in coming back to the project concept report, the, the uh, point in the project that we're working on now, the first milestone of the project concept includes developing the preliminary purpose and need statement. The preliminary purpose and need documents the needs and constraints that drive development of transportation improvements in the study area. It also summarizes the priorities in the development of alternatives and establishes a fundamental purpose of this project. Next slide, please. The preliminary purpose and needs, um, I'm sorry, the project development team's input was critical in developing the preliminary purpose and needs statement and that's inclusive of the needs of varied stakeholders in our community. And on January 11th, the project development team recommended this preliminary purpose and needs statement that's um, presented to you here in summary. There's a complete description of the preliminary purpose and need statement on the RTC website, which I'll post the link uh, later in the slides. So the current state of Santa Cruz County transportation infrastructure is strained, I think we can agree on that, and unable and sometimes to effectively serve the community. It's also insufficient to support a stronger local economy and improved environment, environmental and public health and improve equity and better quality of life. So this preliminary purpose and need statement reflects these deficiencies and identifies needs, which I'm gonna read through. In summary, the primary, the, in summary, the primary project needs are a diverse transportation needs not fully met in slow travel times, deficiencies in roadway travel, and insufficient alternative transportation options, a need for VMT vehicle mile traveled reduction to meet mandates, also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, again, also to meet mandates, and to address missing linkages and safety concerns of existing bicycle and pedestrian facilities in Santa Cruz County. This statement of needs also helps us to define the project purpose. Next slide. So the project's fundamental purpose as proposed is to support and improve equitable multimodal transportation options for Santa Cruz County. The elements are listed here. It is to provide increased access to convenient, accessible and reliable public travel options, to improve transit connections to community activity centers, supporting the local economy and providing better access between housing and jobs. Also, get, also to integrate with plans for future land use, reduce transit travel times and improve transit system reliability, enhance bicycle and pedestrian connectivity and safety, promote alternative transportation modes to increase overall transportation system capacity and reliability, and provide a critical link between the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz and communities in between as an alternative to congested roadways. And lastly, to reduce those vehicle miles travels and associated greenhouse gas emissions. So this is the, what's what we are proposing is the primary purpose of the project. So upcoming engagement, there's a lot happening right now around this project. We hope that you've already heard about it, but if you hadn't, uh, take note here. The commission and its project partners are committing, committed throughout this project to meaningful public engagement, which is one of the reasons we're here before you early on in the project and plan to return at each of the key milestones to the Capital City Council to provide you with information and keep you updated. The community participation is vital, vital to aid in minimizing impacts while meeting the needs of riders, bicyclists, and pedestrians. In order to hear the voices of our community, the project team has scheduled various engagement act opportunities over the next coming weeks. Uh, we do have a um, website, and um, it's a virtual open house that's live. It's been live since last Monday. Uh, we've been briefing stakeholders and having a um, meeting with key partners. Um, next week, as you can see here, we're having virtual and in-person open house meetings. Uh, one is on Monday, February 12th um, at Ramsey Park from 6 to 7.30 p.m and a second on Tuesday, February 13th at the Live Oak Range from 6 to 7.30. And this feedback will be requested on the, the needs as well as the primary project purpose and inform um, the draft purpose that we'll, we'll be moving forward with in the project. Next slide. So future milestones to kind of help you kind of give an idea of how the project's gonna round out going forward. Um, so right now we're at the we are here uh, spot where we're looking at the preliminary purpose and need statement 
Um, and the next step will be to um, develop conceptual alignments for both the rail and the trail along the Santa Cruz branch rail line and to be looking at zero emission vehicle types. So the project development team is just starting to look at those things now and we'll be bringing that forward to the community of this summer and to you. Um, then we'll have a refined conceptual alignment as well as look at station and facility and maintenance locations um, next fall and bring that information back as well. And then with that, refine those concepts based on public input and further analysis to develop a draft project project concept report, as well as associated cost estimates. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate you coming out here to share that with us this evening. Questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for the report. Um, I have a question um, on the slide with the project overview. You might have talked about this, or you probably will answer this question numerous times, but it's just simply about the visual on slide. I think it's the second slide, Julia. Um, in the visual, it shows a really teeny tiny um, proposed coastal rail trail there in Capitol, and then a significant break in the trail. Can you touch on that a little bit? Thanks for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Um, so right now, um, the projects that are moving forward with the Coastal Rail Trail are from Rio Del Mar north to the city of Santa Cruz. But there is, um, right now, as we are, we are not moving forward with the trail over Zocal Creek next to or um, the Capitola Trestle. And so that, that portion of the project is um, shown there in that small green dot. And the zero emission passenger rail trail project is looking at bicycle and pedestrian facilities as well as a rail facility crossing over the Soquel Creek. And we've been referring to that as um, phase two of the segment 11. That, okay. Yeah. Questions or comments on this end? No? Thank you so much. Really yes. appreciate it. And I, I meant to mention that uh, Riley Gerbrand of RTC staff is the project manager for this um, project, and he is on Zoom if there are additional questions that I can't answer. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item four, additional materials. And it looks like we have some. The staff has received additional materials for tonight's agenda. Um, one email correspondence for item 3B and one email correspondence for item 8B. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to item five, oral communications from members of the public. This is a time for any member of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, you'll have up to three minutes for your comments. Please state your name clearly if you'd like it recorded in the minutes. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Goran Klepic. I, I play almost every day at Jade Street Park basketball but that's not what I want to uh, talk about today. Today I made a call to the CPD at 10.50 a.m. exactly because I saw a gang sign or a graffiti sign next to uh, Whole Foods area there. When I uh, made that call, they didn't understand my English very well. I didn't know what to do anymore when I make such a call. Maybe I need to contact the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. They understand Serbian, French, English, Italian uh, that I all speak. Maybe they can help me out and see what I'm talking about here in Capitola. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Okay. <laughs> So I brought the 211 annual report since 211 is um, 211 day. And I don't know. Okay. Uh, good evening, esteemed members of the city council. I'm honored to stand before you today to share some significant insights into our community well being and the vital services we have been able to provide. First and foremost, I want to draw your attention to the invaluable resource we have established, the 211 phone line. In 2023 alone, we received 4,480 calls through this channel, connecting our residents with essential social and health services. Throughout these calls, we were able to provide a staggering 8,000 
uh, 50 referrals, ensuring that individuals in need receive the support they require. In times of crisis, our responsiveness was unwavering. During disasters, we filled 772 calls offering critical information on disaster preparedness, chapter options, and disaster relief efforts. Notably, in collaboration with California Fire Foundation, we distribute one-time financial assist assistance to those impacted by the storms, offering immediate assistance when it was needed most. Understanding the diverse needs of our community is paramount. And this year, we identified several areas where assistance was most required. Of course, housing, utility assistance, food, meals, legal aid, and public safety services emerge as the top needs. Addressing these needs remains central to our mission of serving our community effectively. I'm proud to highlight the invaluable partnership we have forged with key agencies in our region, Community Bridges, Catholic Charities, and St. Vincent de Paul stand out as a pillar of support providing assertion services to our residents. In conclusion, I want to express my gratitude to each member of this council for your unwavering support of our endeavors. Together, we have made a tangible difference in the life of countless, uh, countless individuals, embodying the spirit of community and compassion. As we move forward, let us continue to work hand in hand, ensuring that our city remains a beacon of hope and support, and support for all, um, for all who can, <laughs> for all who call it home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work on this. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lowry Fenton. I'm president of Capital Aptos Rotor. I'm here with our program chair, Pam Goodman, to tell you about our plan for raising money for the Treasure Cove uh, project. Rotary is an organization of 1.4 million around the world that's dedicated to um, community service, to improve standards in all locations, and to advance goodwill and peace throughout the world. Jade Street Park is a, already a place where people gather, and the addition of Treasure Cove will allow children of all abilities to play together. There'll be accessible ramps, slides, swings, as well as a sensory garden and a game table for people who prefer to remain seated. It shows to every child, you belong, you matter, and this place is for you. We're pleased to make this our focus this year for fundraising. We have some fun ways for the community to participate. Most importantly, we're having a uh, dinner March 22nd, where we're gonna honor the service of Zach Friend and Bruce McPherson, retiring supervisors, and tell you more about the park and what we're going to do. Pam and Iris are going to be reaching out to the community to offer opportunities to sponsor the event. All sponsorships dollars are matched with a community uh, with a matching grant from the Monarch Peninsula Foundation, so dollars are doubled. And we'll also offer uh, organizations and individuals an opportunity to donate items for uh, an auction. So Pam, it should be fun reaching out to the community, and we hope to see you all there. I just want to add that um, it's Capitol and Ap Aptos Rotary is really honored to be able to participate in this park, in the creation of this park. And we know that it brings people from all areas. If you hang out at Leo Parks like I do, Leo Haven like I do, there are um, people coming from over the hill, down south. And so, you know, it's going to hurt, help tourism also. but but also be another place for our kids to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We're really grateful for the efforts that the Rotary Club is putting in to fundraise for this. Hello. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, Mayor, Council People. I think we have the form here. A lot of people think that we have representative government, but it's never talked that you're part of a COG, a Council of Governments. That is no more than a Soviet. Uh, it was put together at the University of Chicago uh, with Carnegie, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, Laura Speller uh, Rockefeller Foundation, 
And uh, the person that assembled the finances for that was uh, Daniel Coit Gilman, who in actually incorporated the Skull and Bones network, of which uh, one of the, uh, Zach Friend used to work for, um, one of these members of Skull and Bones. In fact, he had two former employers uh, that were registered as communist lobbyists. Also, we've heard Bruce McPherson mention, you look up on, you go home tonight, and you look up uh, Bruce McPherson and Katrina Lung, front page of U.S. News and World Report. Uh, he received tens of thousands of dollars from Katrina Lung. There's pictures of her alongside the premier of Red China. Um, the person in charge of these uh, CalCog, uh, which is, again, a parallel government which you're not addressing. It's not taught in your elementary school. It's not taught in your high school. It's not taught at the university. And actually, Rotary, by the way, when the UN was formed in San Francisco, the first acting secretary general there uh, was supported by Rotary and the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, that member was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. His name is Alger Hiss. He's a traitor to the country. He's, you know, um, one of the last people. Uh, your kids are being thrown so much glow baloney, it's uh, really pathetic. The man in charge of the University of Chicago, uh, they claim that this is uh, uh, to develop scientific social control. And that's what all of this uh, sustainable stuff is. The man's name was uh, Charles Merriam. He says the human system may be reconditioned through the glands, perhaps through the bloodstreams, like fluoridation, or through any one of a thousand minor manipulations, stimulations, gradations that, my, that silently move uh, subtly to their appointed end. Uh, the uh, most the strongest lobby west of the Mississippi is uh, run is California Forward. That was set up by Leon Panetta who actually gave military and policy information to a red Chinese communist spy who has two plaques on our courthouse uh, today. And neither Bruce McPherson uh, nor uh, Zach Friend will take down where uh, that, uh, that danger that happened. And a lot of our fathers and grandfathers were killed during um, red Chinese activity in Korea and Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other oral communications from members of the public? Seeing none, we will close uh, oral communications and move on to staff and city council comments. We'll start with staff. I don't think staff has any comments this evening. No? Okay. We'll bring it back to council. Any comments on this end? Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank our staff, public works, and our police department again. Once again, we were hit by a a hurricane, if you want to call it that, or a, a cyclone bomb. But weather's changing, but it's good to see that the city was ready and, and uh, things turned out better than they could have been. So great job by everybody. Okay. Comments? No. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'd like to bring it to the attention of our business owners that effective January um, the beginning of the year that all letters of authority applications on file must be notarized in accordance to SB 602. Um, I've talked to our police department a little bit about this, and I've learned that um, we have 41 letters on file, and we do not charge for notar notar mm, notarization. Um, so um, I just would like to ask staff to maybe ensure that we contact all business owners and folks who have letters on file um, to let them know that there's a new um, requirement that the letters must be notarized in order to to be effective. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. We'll move on now to item seven, which is our consent agenda. Uh, all items will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. I can move these consent agenda. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We we'll move on to item 8A, uh, Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Project. Hi. Hi. <laughs> right. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. As you may be aware, we have a project going on out at our wharf right now, and I thought now would be a good time as we've achieved several milestones to uh, have an update. Next slide, please. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, before that last slide, those are all new pilings. So all of our old ones, not all of our old ones, but many of our old ones are wood. All the new pilings on the expanded wharf are of um, FRP, so fiberglass. And so where our old pilings kind of went in at an angle, these go straight in so you can look right down the alley at our new wharf. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of overview, if you are not familiar with the project, key project elements are widening the wharf um, to make it more resilient, less susceptible to, right, where someone is pointing there for me, <laughs> um, is the widening bit there, um, looking out towards the wharf house. Um, fixing pilings, doing full deck replacement, full railing replacement to current code, and the addition of restroom facilities, both at the head and the base of the wharf. It's really to ensure the wharf's long-time resilience and enjoyment for all of the Capitola residents and visitors. Um, we started our construction with Cushman contracting this past September. Um, so progress updates, some of the most recent items completed are the removing of all of these old pilings from 19, I want to say 28. Um, lots of junior guards have run into these. <laughs> and so I got, got several calls about it in the past couple summers. And so those are now removed and no longer hazards. Um, they've also been saved for potential use as um, aesthetic elements of the community center renovation project. And then on the bottom there, you can see where we have been getting to our widening. So the text says 41, but really we are at bent 43 of 46. So we are rapidly approaching our full widening length and we're expected to get there in the next few weeks. So that's very exciting for us. Next slide, please. And then most recently, yesterday, we got our restroom delivered, which was also very, very exciting. It came on a ship from New Zealand. Um, and so that was put in today. The utilities aren't hooked up. We're going to do a whole process where we make sure this thing is operational before we let people in it. But it was delivered and placed in the past couple days. Next slide, please. Um, so we have had some setbacks in this project. Um, most recently, the uh, December storms, we had some broken pilings. You can see there in the middle picture, there's quite a bit of debris, though not as much debris as from January 2023, that came in and hit some of our older piles, um, requiring replacement of some that we weren't intending on replacing. There was also some damage and deformation to places where we were currently constructing and really led to some hazardous conditions. I will say that we have fully fixed the mid-span repairs and have kept widening the wharf. And we have not yet gotten to the seaward side, the head of the wharf repairs, and we haven't fully completed that assessment of what damage is there as we are working steadily from the landward side out towards the end of the wharf. Next slide, please. Um, so unfortunately, also in this latest storm, the wharf house sustained some really major damage. Um, as you can see there, the seaward facing wall, which is where all those windows were, has completely caved in. Uh, what you can't see in this picture is parts of that. It took part of the foundation with it and is inside the building. And so with the combination of this most recent damage, damage we knew from January, which we had done a hazmat evaluation to show that there was a significant, basically a gut job needed of that building, and then also the condition of the roof and standing water. Um, that building is deemed a total loss. Uh, both myself as a registered civil engineer in the state of California and our building official have made this determination and we do plan on moving forward with the demolition of this building. Next slide, please. Um, with the widening, we've been able to recently more easily get out into both of the buildings. Prior to that, we had visited the buildings before, but mostly by boat. It was very limited access up until just a few weeks ago. So we were able to do these assessments both on the wharf house and the boat and bait shop. We've also found significant uh, damage to the boat and bait shop. Um, there's issues with some of their hazardous materials containment out there. Um, issues where the building is not to code and is currently red tagged. Everything on the wharf is currently red tagged. It has been since January 2023. Um, and it's going to be re required to be addressed either by some major renovation or potentially demolition to be determined. Next slide, please. Um, other ongoing challenges on the wharf, as mentioned before, the head of the wharf assessment is ongoing as we get more access to um, analyze what's happened out there in the structure of the building. Obvious of the wharf, 
obviously the buildings. And then the winter just keeps on coming. Um, so there's still storm events that we anticipate having prior to finishing this project. And we're really using all the measures we can to adapt and do the work we can and have it be the most solid uh, construction site that we can have so we don't have further damages as we go along. So we are actively working with the our engineering team, Moffat and Nickel, who has been with us this entire journey, and also with the contractor to really avoid any damage that can be avoided with our ongoing winter. Next slide, please. Um, so the budget on this one. So we still have some uncertainties, again, with the head of the wharf. Um, some of our funding has been on hold. So if we start up at the top, we have the budget that we had presented back I want to say in May, when we bid this project of $8.9 million. This doesn't include the $500,000 that was awarded in the state budget that is currently on hold uh, with the community center funds. Um, and then we have our expenses. So we have our initial contract with Cushman Contracting. We have change orders that we all very much anticipated with this project because it is a structure in the ocean. Once you start removing decking, you find other things pilings that need to be repaired, other structural elements that need to be repaired. So that was not surprising in any way. The storm damage was very much surprising and not something we had allocated into this budget. And so to date, our contingency that's remaining is around $336,000. However, that does not include the cost of the building demolition that we know we have to do at the Wharf House, which considering the hazmat situation at the wharf house that a lot of that stuff to be demoed is hazardous materials and has to be removed before the building is demoed and then the location of the building being out on a wharf that has restricted access and weight limits it will be more an expensive project is than if we were going to go demo some other building on land and so we expect that to be 400 to 700 thousand dollars and we are actively working on getting multiple quotes on that right now next slide please so next step in our timeline, um, we still expect completion of this project in fall of 2024. We are continuing to get our widening all the way out to Bent 46. We're actively coordinating with the businesses out there on the wharf and continuing to assess the damages we have. Again, our contingency, while currently is at 300,000, really is less because we have to do the building demolition. Um, and that we intend on doing a separate engagement process as a city following this project to envision what would be at that wharf house site. So no determination has been made to that site other than the building requires to be removed. Next slide, please. So in summation, we have made quite a bit of progress on this, build, um, this structure. Despite a lot of the challenges we have, we have been able to consistently move forward with construction and repair of the wharf. Um, still have some assessments and challenges to go, considering it is still raining and storming, but we are looking ahead to getting this project done still in the fall of 2024, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? Jessica, you mentioned that the um, demo could range, it's a, there's a pretty big range. Is that an, through an RFP process or, cause you mentioned getting quotes, we don't need to go through. So ideally it'd be a change order with our current contractor. They also have options oh, do with it. who do, does the remediation part. They may choose not to do the remediation and just the demo. They may choose to sub the whole thing, but we are working actively with them to make sure we get the most competitive price within that change order. Gotcha, thank you. Questions? No? Jessica, the, um, with only 336 in the contingency and the demolition alone being 400 to 700, what do we, do we have plans? Is that gonna come back to council for future consideration? How are we looking at funding the demolition? So being hopeful, the $500,000 comes through the state and we don't get to the point where we actually have spent that contingency prior to that. But if it turns out that that state money is not gonna materialize, we would have to return to council for additional funding. All right, uh, no additional questions. We will take this out to public comment. Do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none, uh, we'll bring it back to council. This was just uh, receiving a progress report, so there's no action on this item. Thank you for sharing an update with us. All right, we're gonna go to item 8B, uh, housing element update.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you tonight, I'm going to give you an update on our housing element. I believe we're pulling up the slides currently. Um, back in January, we heard from the state HCD office letting us know that we've got additional work to do on our housing element. You'll recall back in November, we adopted our housing element. Um, the HCD gave us quite a few minor comments and then one major item that we need to revisit is they're looking for a commitment um, for a height increase and floor area ratio exception for the mall site. They also um, talked about density, but den there is no density requirement uh, at the mall. So next slide, please. So mall redevelopment, currently we have a section within our code that's pretty new. It came when we certified our code in 2021 for incentives for um, in, in exchange for community benefits. For the mall, uh, redevelopment counts as a community benefit. And the current incentive increases the height from 40 feet within the regional commercial zone up to 50 feet in the regional commercial. And it also include, um, increases the floor area ratio of from 1.5 to 2.0, and that's the overall square footage that you're allowed to build on that site. Um, I'll have further slides about what floor area ratio is further down the line. But um, so with the, the mall has provided public comment and um, they, in order to make their project financially feasible, they're asking for a height up to 75 feet, and then the floor area ratio be modified to have an exemption for garages, parking garages. Next slide, please. Um, so within our housing element, we identify 645 housing units on the Malone Geyer site. 419 of these are affordable units, so they'd be deed restricted to specific incomes. Um, in looking at the build out of 645 units, our housing element specialist said, well, this is feasible. You can build those on the site. However, it's likely not economical, economically feasible because you're deed restricting these units and you can only uh, charge a certain amount of money per income qualification. So um, in order to make it economically feasible, um, additional development is likely necessary to make that occur. So next slide, please. So the request from the mall owner, which I already stated on the previous slide, was to go up to 75 feet. And um, this would result in our estimates um, utilizing an HCD formula is um, 1,000 to 1,300 units. So it increases the number on the site substantially. And the other request is for the floor area ratio exception for the parking garage. Um, and in my opinion, this is something we should um, really consider and probably accept. The state is going in a direction of where they're removing parking requirements from, redevelop from development projects. And because this is a location close to the metro station, the metro is really providing more service these days, I think, in the, very, in the near future, this will probably become a high quality transit center, which would qualify for not requiring any parking on the site. So it makes sense to put an incentive in there for parking garages so that we have more parking on the site um, and don't create issues for the surrounding neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna quickly go through a couple developments that have, are either in development or have occurred um, close by within the city and county of Santa Cruz. I think they're mostly city of Santa Cruz, actually. So this is 50 Felker Street. It's 63 feet tall, five stories, and has 35 units in it. Next slide, please. Um, this is just showing the difference in height. Your, your first floor is typically a lot taller, especially when you've got um, commercial in there. This project does not have commercial. It has a garage on the first story, and the first story is at 13 feet. Next slide, please. Next is 130 Center Street. It's 74 feet, so this is comparable to what's being requested at the mall. It's six stories and 233 units. Next slide. I just want to point out in the first story, it's at a 15-foot height limit um, for that ground floor commercial that really makes it an enticing um, commercial area. Next slide. 324 Front Street, the Cruise Hotel, again, at 75 feet. 
Six stories tall, 232 rooms. Next slide. I'm just showing this actually has parking underneath. Um, the first story is at, uh, that red line is showing where the, the new grade is. And the first story with the commercial use is has 15 foot heights. So next slide. Uh, Capitola Mall, this is the old, this is the 2019 conceptual review. Um, in, in the conceptual review, it was uh, six stories on this frontage at 75 feet. The plan that came in in 2019 was for 637 units. And as you can see, it's a mixed use project with ground floor commercial. Next slide, please. This is showing, um, this is where um, 38th Avenue would have extended through the project. And here you're seeing seven stories because they don't have the ground floor commercial. There's uh, the tenant leasing spaces on the bottom. It's an office space. And so they're able to fit in seven stories. I also want to point out in this slide that you see the garage on the lower left corner, the garage door. This, there's a garage within this structure that's completely wrapped by the architecture. So it really makes a nice aesthetic for the experience of the, of the mall and the street frontage. Next slide, please. This is 820 Pacific Avenue. So now we're, we're breaking through the 75 foot height and I'm giving you a couple more examples of higher heights. 80 feet high, seven stories, 85 units. So um, next slide. That's the first two stories in that building is the first story is commercial. The second story is office space. So you're seeing a 16 foot height on the first story and then 12 for the second and then 10 for the stories above. Next slide, please. Um, and 100 Laurel Street. This is at 82 feet in height, seven stories, 205 units. Next slide. And this is showing within that building, there's uh, parking on the first uh, two stories and then housing above. Next slide. And this is 530 Front Street. Again, another mixed use development project. It's almost at 90 feet, eight stories. It's mixed use with a lot of commercial on the ground floor. Next slide, please. Um, and again, ground floor commercial at 15 feet. So really when you see the height request for 75 feet, it doesn't equate to seven stories, it's typically six. So I just wanted to give you some examples so you know what you could expect in the future if we go in this direction tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So the other request was for an exception to the floor area ratio for parking garages. Next slide. This is a little diagram uh, showing what floor area ratio is. So if um, floor area ratio is the gross building floor area that you're allowed divided by the area of the lot. So I think the, the um, diagram on the right is the easiest to follow. If you had a one story building, it would cover the entire lot or at two stories, it would cover half the lot, but you're, you're allowed one square foot for every square foot of lot under a 1.0. So for the request for to FAR, you'd be able to build uh, two square feet for every square foot of ground on the mall site. Next slide, please. So here's the um, previous 2019 conceptual review. And I'm just highlighting where the parking garages were proposed with the, the black cars that you can see in the image. Next slide, please. Um, the parking garage to the north, it had one side of the building that was open and visible from the target parking lot or from Clare Street. Next slide. Uh, the lower parking lot, the building was completely wrapped and that was the image I, I brought up earlier. Next slide. Um, so here I'm just giving you an example of the wrapped parking and the entry for the garage pointed out with the arrow and then the unwrapped and just the visual differences there. If if city council were to give direction tonight to move forward with a 75 foot height, a few things that we would be considering is um, objective standards to ensure that any future project really blends in and uh, the architecture, um, there, you know, there's a big difference between the image on the bottom and the top. Um, and so there's that review of objective standards to make sure it, um, it's a great project and the final design. Um, next slide, please. So this went to Planning Commission um, at our last meeting last week. There was support in general for the 75 foot height and also for the garage and they um, definitely agreed with the incentives for on-site parking. 
they also suggested there were a few few of the items that planning commission was concerned with they they feel that um the mall site there's a lot of support by the community to redevelop the mall and that's where they could support the 75 feet height they did not want us to extend the 75 foot height limit to the entire zone so the general commercial zone they also have concerns about at 75 feet how that building interacts with the pedestrian frontage and the street and sun um, and that visual experience so they would like objective standards if we were to bring this back um, to just ensure that there's like a daylight plane and um, typically a lot of codes will have a daylight plane in which a structure can go up say three four stories along the sidewalk and then it has to um, gradually build up as as you go back to just ensure that it doesn't overwhelm the, the experience um, and they definitely uh, like the idea of some type of objective um, criteria for future garages but so that, that was the feedback we got from Planning Commission and uh, next slide please tonight our recommended action is we um, this is just advisory we don't have a housing element um, drafted update for you to review tonight our what i'm planning on doing is going back to the hcd with revisions based on planning commission and city council guidance um, we're looking for a conditional approval from the hcd instead of going if we go back through um, public hearings right now for adoption there's a six-week waiting period for us to publish the document before you can actually adopt it again. So we just want to keep this moving, get to a place that we feel comfortable that the HCD is actually going to certify it before bringing it back through adoption hearings. And we've um, talked with our attorneys about this, taking uh, this route rather than going back, and this was the, um, the recommended approach. So tonight I'm asking for feedback on the two items that I brought to you this evening, the 75 foot height and also the floor area ratio exemption for parking garages. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Questions on this end? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I have a handful of things. First, I would be in support of the 75 foot height. Alexander, and just questions first. We can do comments when we come back after public. After. Okay, okay, public, okay. Uh, comment. So, my questions are in regards to Merlone Geyer's um, request to have the 75 foot height and floor area ratio exclusion dependent from city code section 17.88. Has there been any discussion on that or what are your thoughts about that? Yes, so actually um, a representative from Merlon Geyer is here tonight, Dave Geyser, and um, we, that was brought up in their original letter to HCD and you brought that to my attention um, more recently in, in an email. Um, my response to that is the Planning Commission really wasn't supportive of rezoning or not rezoning but reestablishing the zone height as 75 feet for the all of the general commercial and our recommendation is really to keep it in that incentivized area so that not all of um, general commercial is north of capitola road extending to the highway so that whole area wouldn't be have a height of 75 feet allowed just just an incentive for the mall so um we're trying to, does that answer your question? So, I guess I, I'm a little bit um, unsure about when I'm reading that a section of the code. It says for along 41st Avenue, there's the four criteria to meet community benefits. Is that right? Yes. So which one would the mall or which of these okay. four so meet to guarantee that they do meet the community benefit we would be revising that section that that section of code to have to, uh, just a, a carve out instead of including it with all of 41st avenue and the front edge so along 41st see just the mall just the mall and then what what's the plan to include that or would that come back to council at a later date that will come as a zoning code update at a later date but it would it would increase the height 
and um, and also have the exclusion to the floor area ratio for garage if recommended this evening. And then we'd also include objective standards to make sure that the impacts are mitigated. So it's a future zoning code update. Luckily, it's not in the coastal zone, so it wouldn't be the timing wouldn't be impacted by coastal certification. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but just to confirm, Katie, a lot of cities are having to do later zoning code updates related to their housing element, right? Yes, and we've got a long list of zoning code updates relative to our housing code element. And the um, objective standards that you were mentioning that would apply to the mall. Yes. And when would those be discussed? Is that something we're talking about tonight or would that come back or? No, that would come back. So whenever we write new code, especially zoning code, we have to publish it for a certain amount of time um, and have public hearings for the zoning code update. So that would go to planning commission. Planning commission would then make a recommendation to city council and then city council would bring it forward to you for adoption. And our list of housing element updates includes about 20 items at this point. Okay. For the zoning code update. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Katie. Um, so it's always really um, tricky to separate this HCD stuff from the zoning code. So I'm going to also try to keep them separated. When we're talking about the 75 feet increase or two up to, you mentioned a really interesting number of 1,000 to 1,300 potential units. By increasing these um, 20, per, 20 units per acre, is that assuming that, or is that not assuming, will there be 1,300 units potentially on the property compared to the original conceptual design that was presented to us in 2019 with the 600 by us increasing it? There's um, a likely, likelihood, like the HCD, they, the formula they use is um, 10 units per story per acre. So we ran those numbers and ended up at the 1,300 if you were to do at 75 feet. Um, but with ground floor commercial, it's going to, uh, part of the project will probably be just residential, as we saw in the first in the 2019 application, and parts of it will be mixed use and possibly even office space on the second story. So that's where that like fluctuation comes in between 1,000 and 1,300. Again, the architect for the project is here this evening, um, and he could probably answer that question better. Um, is it so... Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of the better way to say this. So we, HCD, if I recall, when they were here helping us through the process, or when we were writing the housing element, I'm sorry, I'm saying HCD, which is probably not the housing element, um, there were some concerns of us kind of putting all of our eggs in one basket. And it seems that we would be making this adjustment to meet ARENA numbers amongst all those, all the other properties we've identified. So can you talk a little bit how about that and why we would be doing that? Is it something that the letter from the housing element folks from HCD, HCD wanted, or is this just a, simply a request from developers saying this is a good opportunity to, to, to you know, to make this request at this time? Okay. So um, for, first, just for clarification, RRM Design Group is our consultant working on our housing element. The HCD provided comments back to us during this, and the HCD is the state um, authority that will certify or not certify your housing element. So the letter we got from HCD at this point, um, based on um, public comment received from Merlot Geyer partners about the feasibility of developing that many units on their site, was asking us for a commitment towards the height on this property. Okay. Um, we also went over the percentage in our letter. We, you know, I can't remember what our number was, 1,000, the buffer. So if we didn't, 
increase to 75 feet and give potentially meet Merlot and Geyer's request, are we still within our numbers um, with, with our, within our arena numbers the way we, if we didn't do that? We would, well, so it's feasible to develop the number of units that we suggested within our housing element, but the HCD is saying it's probably not economically feasible. So it's, there's still a buffer there that we could decrease the overall requirement for uh, the Mar for Merlot and Geyer, mm -hmm. and, and then it might be more economically feasible at, a, at less height. Yeah. However, I caution us to remove that buffer because anytime a development comes in. I guess it, it, um, my concern is that we went through extensive community um, outreach when first working with Merlot and Geyer to just get to the 636 units as presented in 2019. And we're not having that conversation in depth with the community again, but yet zoning this area for potentially 1,300 um, by allowing this, this increase to 75 feet. Um, can you talk a little bit about that or process um, how, as council, we would mitigate that or as a city, we would be facilitating those conversations? I know we essentially get to talk about it later, right, mm -hmm. um, and review conceptual designs and new things, but, if I, you know, yeah. it's a little bit backwards in my mind. It is a little, so, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, so th the following, the steps that would occur is we really, before bringing forth any type of amendment or discussion on 75 feet, we wanted to check in with Planning Commission and City Council. If the HCD finds that what we draft would suffice in terms of getting a certified letter, um, a certification of our housing element, then the, the public process, it, the, the whole, um, there'd be a six week um, it, time period in which we publish exactly what the updated changes are. And, and within that, um, for the housing element, there would be more of a, just a commitment to um, updating our zoning code to allow 75 feet on the mall. So the public, that, that the updated housing element would be available for six weeks for public comment. It would also go before planning commission and there'd be a chance for the public to weigh in at that point and let us know whether or not there was support um, for the amendments to the housing element. And then it would come to city council to see whether or not, you know, with a recommendation from planning commission and then city council. If at that time there was a lot of uh, public coming out against the 75 feet, then we have the uh, we have the ability to change what's drafted and submit something different and come up with a different alternative for our housing element. Then there's another six weeks after that. No, we could at that point we could update with the the new language, it's just more risky in terms of whether or not the HCD would accept our changes. Questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just have a question about the um, objective standards of, especially having something uh, required to be tiered, wouldn't that greatly reduce the number of possible units and then reduce the economic feasibility of it, sort of negating the purpose of increasing the height to 75 feet? It's a really large site with really large blocks. You'd refer, um, like the blocks aren't that small. So by doing the tiered, it will have a definite impact on the number of units, um, but it's very typical to require these um, a tier, tiered buildings in these situations. Um, so I guess my question is, do you think that HCD or Marlon Geyer would still accept it if we did require the tiers, um, accept that it is economically feasible? Is that, was that built into their assumptions of requ requesting the height to be set at 75 feet? Yeah, I think during public comment, it would be appropriate for uh, Dave Geyser to comment on that. He actually commented on that during planning commission as acceptable. So. Thank you. That's the architect, mm -hmm. and he's here. Yes. 
Yeah, I'd like I'd like to ask questions if you wouldn't mind. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Geyser. I'm with Merlot and Gar Partner. I'm managing director. Thank you. We appreciate you being here this evening. This is um, a development that we've all been really looking forward to see come to fruition for a long time. Um, so we saw, um, so I first, maybe let's just address what I feel like is really the elephant in the room. Is there going to be 1,300 units there? We, have if no we increase this to 75? Our original application was for about, what, 630, 640 okay. units. Because we have existing tenants, existing leases uh, that we need to keep in effect, um, and because the need or our desire to have a, uh, a multi-use um, with, with retail and housing, uh, we have to respect parking requirements and that as well, and how where we can stack and where we can't stack housing above a retail. So we have we have no plans currently for uh, a thousand or thirteen hundred units. That I would doubt today if that were, if that were possible, give, even given the seventy five foot height limit and uh, the exception on the the FAR and the, the parking uh, structures there. So, so we, we don't have any plans today for anything like that. Okay. If for some reason down the line that were to change, um, a thousand units, even if there's one person per unit, is a ten percent increase in our population in one development. So, if that would be the case, would Merlin Geyer have any um, interest in discussions about infrastructure improvements in addition to the development? Because clearly, a ten percent increase in the population is going to have a lot of impact on roads and schools and the need for police services and fire services? Yep. My guess is that environmental impact report will identify all of those impacts. And then, of course, the mitigation measures to, you know, to address those impacts would have to be uh, you know, addressed by the, by the developer. Okay. Great. Uh, and then I guess my, my last question um, is, so we saw a slide of an 82-foot building with only 205 units. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us about um, the idea of economic feasibility and why um, an increased height or an increased number of units would be required, because um, the slide we saw was seven or eight feet and it only had 205 units. And so I'm wondering how that was economically feasible, and not that you were the developer for that. But and again, we're speaking hypothetically here too. Mm -hmm. We don't have, we're not just planning on bringing back the same plan. We would have to go back and relook at you know all of the impacts uh, that we've seen happen over the pandemic with the impact on retail and uh, uh, economic viability just with financing and those kind of things. Um, I think our largest concern with economic viability is the requirement for this, uh, this workforce housing. It, we don't think that makes the project work. Um, in fact, we would look for nothing more than the, uh, the affordability component that's currently imposed on all projects within the city of Capitola, not, not the 419 workforce housing. That, that renders the project infeasible. So I think that's what Katie was talking about, going back and re looking at um, what what does make the project feasible. And in our mind, that is the the rate. What is the normal affordable requirement for housing of this type? I don't think it's really the, the height so much. Um, we we don't think we need to build higher than seventy five feet uh, here in terms of having that standard, which is why we suggested it. Um, there's we just don't think it's we. Uh, that's not what we do necessarily. Uh, we can do seven stories and in, in um, 75 feet. If you go higher than that, you get in a high rise and that gets into certain building types that are more expensive to build and again, go into the economic feasibility. So we don't think we need more than 75 feet in height and to achieve a product that makes sense. It's just the, the affordability component uh, shouldn't exceed what, what the standard is for the city. Okay, so, so if it's the, and, and we're not talking about lowering the affordability component in this discussion this evening based on the presentation we just received, right? Correct. So if if it's the 409, it's 400 and what was it, 19? 419. Affordable units is what makes it infeasible, then there would need to be an increase in the market, in the number of market rate units in order for it to pencil out. Oh yeah. So, so we're at 600 something right now, but you're saying we're not necessarily, there's no plans to go up into the thousands. No, which why which is why four hundred nineteen units would be, you know, forty, fifty, sixty percent of the total number of units, which which doesn't work. Which doesn't work, quite frankly. Okay. Do, do you do you understand why I'm confused right now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm confused though because we're not talking about removing the affordability requirement right now, and the whole idea is that if we are going to increase the parking ratio and the height limit, that HCD will say, okay, now you've changed your um, 
your requirements to make building feasible, but you're telling me that that's not what's preventing be building from being feasible. No, I think the HCD recommended a, uh, an economic feasibility analysis of what that, what that workforce housing requirement would do to the affordability of the project, did they not? No, the HCD is looking for a commitment of up to 75 feet based on Merlone Geyer's uh, public comments stating that they need 75 feet in order to make this feasible, the project feasible. That's a number of units. That's not, that. we've also, I believe, submitted comments dealing with the fact that the number of affordable units at 65% of the number of, you know, number of units just doesn't work. Okay, so I guess, um, okay. Yeah, I'll save it for comments. Okay, thank uh, Any other questions? Well, I guess it. I feel like this conversation's a little ahead of the game if we don't even know what the potential amount of units are. If we're, A, we're talking about 600 something and then we, then we threw out 1,000 to 1,300. So is, is that, is it going to, if we raise to 75 feet, is it going to be somewhere in the middle of that, those numbers or? Our previous application was for 75 feet in height and 636 units. So we, so in order to get to the 636 units, as assumed in the, the housing element, we would need 75 feet in height. That's what, that was our previous plans. And I think that's why we came up with that number. So in order, in order to do the 636 units, we need 75 feet in height. That's what we're saying. Because that was our previous project that we did. Got it. it is that true? So in 2019, when you submitted the conceptual review to us, or design, excuse me, um, that was the 636, the original photo was with 75 feet. Okay. Right. Okay. That makes more sense to me now. Yeah, and it wasn't, it wasn't 75 feet and we can do 1300 units. I, again, I don't see how we could do right. that. Right. Um, however, the, the question is that in order for your numbers still to work out, there's still a problem with the 419 units that are workforce housing. And so an we still don't, we uh, still might not have a project, with, but that's for a different day, different discussion. We're just talking about units in terms of the height and the FAR, that generates the number of units. The economic feasibility goes to the number of workforce housing units assigned to the, to the site. Can you tell me when we would be able to have that conversation? Or what, you know, is that when we go to zoning or when they submit a different design or, because this is just for our, eight, our housing element. This is just for the housing element and the, the request that we saw. Um, in terms of when could we, f the economic feasibility, so we do have a study occurring right now with Cosmont um, looking at land use and feasibility of, um, economic feasibility of redevelopment. I will say that um, I think there's a disconnect that is uh, coming up Currently, with the regarding the letter that was submitted to HCD, because there um, they there was definitely recognition of the number of units that we were placing on the mall for mall redevelopment, and my understanding was in order to make it feasible, uh, they were requesting the the request that I went over in my presentation this evening. So I think there is a, a little bit of a disconnect. I was not aware that they were um, asking for the 75 feet based on the 2019 plan. My understanding was the 75 feet, and it would apply to the entire site. Um, not the 2019 plan did not have 75 feet heights throughout the entire plan. There were areas that were still at um, two stories um, that could, and, and a lot more property owned by Merlin Geyer that could be developed um, on the mall site. So, my understanding from that letter was that the requests were in order to make redevelopment feasible on that site and produce our numbers in terms of RENA. So Katie, um, you mentioned a timeline for us to get back to, to them. What was, where are we on that timeline? Six week, where are we in the six weeks? For HCD? Yeah. We were hoping to bring them just draft edits as soon as next week. Mm -hmm. um, because you just learned something new. I'm just curious about whether we need more information um, based off of what we just learned today. So we're under the gun at this point to get the housing element done. Uh, the day before we adopted housing element, you'll recall we got a letter from our loan guy that asked for three specific things. Subsequently, our housing element that we submitted to HCD was rejected, and they asked us essentially to do those three things. So 
Planning Commission has recommended those steps. Um, I think every day that we go without having taken a step in terms of submitting uh, puts the city in, at risk to some degree. So I think my recommendation would be to focus on the Planning Commission's recommendation, which is about allowing 75 feet in the zone of the mall. And about That's not my question. My question is, because you learn more information this evening, do you need more time to think about what we're really asking for? Because we don't want to see our developer not succeed. We really want this project, but you just also learned some new information. So my question is, Katie, for on your end, do you need more time for that? You know, I think it's worth, um, if there's agreement that 75 feet would work, that we move forward with comments to HCD and simultaneously um, the two of us work together, our teams, to discuss exactly what that is. Because at this point, we're just looking for, we just need to get the housing element update in the, it take, we, it's another 60 day review by HCD to get their initial comments. So we'll get that rolling. But if David and I and David's team sit down and we figure out that, um, we need to adjust something, we would bring it back to Planning Commission and City Council and just to have it moving. Thank you, we appreciate it. Katie, I have one more question for you before we go to public comment. We zoned this for a certain density and a certain number of housing units based on the housing element, but that doesn't mean that it's required, that the developer's required to build housing there, correct? Correct. So my concern I guess what I'm asking you, is it possible that we could put in an allowance for 75 feet in height and a 2.0 floor area ratio and not mess with the affordability requirement and then have the developer come to us and say, well, we're going to build a 75 foot office building here now? We can structure it so that that would not happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we will close uh, council questions for now and bring it out to public comment. And seeing no members of the public, we will bring it back to council for uh, deliberation and discussion. And there's no vote on this, so just deliberation and discussion. Comments? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, I would agree with the planning commission, as long as we can keep the objective standards. Um, it has to be a project that's good for the developer, but it also has to be a project good for the city. So if we can keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Um, personally, I think 75 feet might be too high, but we probably have to see where it takes us. We don't have to make the decisions now, but uh, we need to keep moving. So I'd be in support of that. Um, I agree with Council Member Clark. Um, I also think that um, looking into the wrapped version of the garage it would be my take, um, along with the tiered approach. Um, definitely you know with the whole like sun sunshine requirements or whatever they're called um that's important to me um but yeah other than that i would echo what joe said and take the direction from planning commission too thank you um yeah i i think it's what's really important for me is transparency with the community and when you see larger numbers thrown around without conversation it just makes me really um hesitant right and so I, it makes sense i appreciate merlon guyer being back at the table to have these conversations because we've waited a long time um i have concerns that this still is a project that doesn't um isn't economically feasible for you um and so i hope that you find time to work with staff and can so that we can keep this project moving um and that's why i'm in a, I, i'm happy to to move with um, the Planning Commission's recommendations in this, but I really encourage having those conversations and to continue them. Um, in regards to the objective standards, I think you got enough feedback from Planning Commission in, in regards to the wrapped, um, wrapped garage and the daylight plane. Um, that's what it was called, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, you know, I think just overall, as you continue to update us to just uh, remind the community how this is different than, you know, when we actually see a project in front of us and that they have community and there's opportunity for input because as our mayor said this, if there were over 1,000 
people added to our beautiful city of Capitola that has a significant impact on our resources, our community, our streets, our schools. Um, and so I just want the community to know that we're, we recognize that. And this decision this evening um, is not, it has nothing to do with creating 1,300 um, units. So thank you. Those are my comments. I would also support the 75 foot and um, exclusion of the parking structures from the bar ratio. I'd also be in favor of um, revisiting the uh, community benefit standards, making those more objective or um, ensuring that Merlon Geyer or whoever develops the mall is able to do so without being more security and what they can expect from the city um, and that we do everything that we can to make this pencil out and be a good partner to them so that this actually happens in a reasonable time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, um, I, I'll be honest. I feel like our hands are kind of tied here at this point. Um, we need affordable housing and Zero affordable housing does nothing for us. I'm not thrilled with the idea of lowering the number of affordable housing units that we're going to have here when we're the most expensive housing market in the country. Um, but I understand the need to move forward um, with our housing element because the note that was provided essentially caused HCD to decide that that was what was preventing our housing element from being able to be certified. And it's important that we have a certified housing element. Um, so I, I would uh, move forward with my colleague, with what my colleagues are suggesting with the 75 feet in height and the uh, 2.0 floor area ratio. And we'll have discussions about the rest of it at, a, at, a, at another time. Uh, I also think the wrapped garage is important, though less important than housing affordability. Um, okay, I think that was it. Thank you. I appreciate okay. your direction tonight. Thank you. All right. We'll move on uh, to item 8C, strategic plan, project overview, and timeline. Hello, uh, Mayor Brown and Council. Thank you. I'm just here for a brief second. Um, I remain excited about this project. As you know, developing a strategic plan is in your fiscal year goals currently. And I'm just here to introduce our fabulous consultants, Barry Dunn. We have Maddie Powers and Michelle Kennedy, I believe, to present on um, as the experts on this project and how it will be achieved. So thank you. And I will be here if you have questions. Thank you, Chloe. Um, it looks like Michelle still needs to be promoted to panelist. We're working on it on our end. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank Who's you for being sent here. an invitation. Are you able to and hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Do you all have? I'm here. Um, and I just want to make sure that oh. um, all the tech is right. Ms. Kennedy, we were able to hear you for a second, and now you're cutting out. Can we try? Your, can we do an audio check one more time? Yes. Hi. There you are. Yes. Thank hello. You. Thank you for being here. Okay. Great. Well, with your permission, we'll go ahead and share our screen and get going on the presentation we have for you tonight. So, good evening. It's really exciting to be with you and to be at the stage of formally kicking this project off and sharing with you the approach that we're bringing to this project in collaboration with the city. I'm, um, I'll, we'll introduce ourselves in just a moment, but Maddie, if you wanna go to the next slide. I'm having some difficulty, Michelle, give me one moment. The tech is always the hardest part. <laughs> No worries. Let me know, Maddie, if it's easier for me to share. Are, are you both able to see into chambers or are you seeing a picture of yourself? 
We are seeing ourselves. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we will just be disembodied voices to you, but we are glad that you're here. <laughs> we were watching you before, so okay. we know it. <laughs> we have a sense of who's in the room. Because I'm working through it on my end too. We're just Sorry working on that. some tech stuff on on our end, and we'll we'll be ready in okay, just Michelle. a minute. Thank this you for your patience. Easier. Oh, can everyone see the screen now? Yes. Okay. Oh, great. All right, so this is our agenda. We're going to introduce our team to you, um, give you an overview of the um, sort of how we um, are going to approach strategic planning, an overview of the process, a few details on the project approach and um, our timeline. And then we're happy to take questions um, either during the presentation or at the end, whatever you prefer. So this is our project team. There are two of us here this evening. I'm Michelle Kennedy. I'm the project manager and lead facilitator. Just a little bit about my background. Um, I've been conducting strategic planning for local governments as a consultant for almost 30 years now. Prior to that, I worked in government sector in a variety of different roles, policy roles, uh, budget roles, um, communication roles. Uh, so have a long, long background in, in serging government. Um, Seth Hedstrom is our project principal, and I always say to our clients, if you don't see him much, that's a good thing because it means the project is going well. Um, his role is to make sure that um, our team has everything we need to produce quality work for you. Um, so Seth is kind of our behind the scenes support, but he gets involved if we run into any challenges or we need to um, adjust the scope of the project for some reason. Um, Maddie, why don't you go and then you can introduce Karen. Yes, thank you, Michelle. My name is Maddie Power Spencer, and I'm proposed as a facilitator and research analyst. In this role, I will be assisting Michelle Kennedy and the rest of our team with the um, approach that we're, we're about to talk about with the environmental scan, as well as um, facilitating the development sessions that are coming up. Karen Wichert is also on our team. She's a facilitator. Her background um, is 20 years in local government experience that she brings to the team as an assistant county manager, as well as a city manager. And she is a um, bring quite a depth of knowledge, especially when it comes to our performance measures, which we will talk about um, as well. Thanks, Michelle. And both Maddie and I are West Coast based. Oh, Maddie, if you go back to that slide for just a minute. Of course. Um, we're, we're very close, uh, easy to get there. And so we're going to be your primary on-site folks for the project. You also see that box at the bottom. Um, we have a whole bench of consultants that we have hired directly out of local government that represent almost every function that local government is involved in. So for example, we have a former police chief, we have a couple of former parks and recreation directors. Um, so if we go into the strategic plan and some of the priority areas we identify, we want that extra expertise, we can draw on that team if needed. Okay, now next slide, Maddie. So these are the three phases of the project that we'll be engaged in. We're, we're in phase one right now, um, working with Jamie and Chloe to get a really good project plan together, a good project schedule together, detailed project plan and schedule together. We're just gonna share the high level with you this evening. Um, and really working to identify the different members of your community and inside the city government organization and different stakeholders that need to be involved in the pro project in what way and when. So that's all part of that planning phase to make sure that we've really thought it through. And then in the second phase is where we're going to do all of the community engagement and what we call our environmental scan, which is really um, sort of this point in time view of where you are as a city government and as a, and as a community that serves as a, a really important foundational piece off of which to actually create a strategic plan, which is the third phase. And we'll share some more details about each of these phases in the upcoming slides. So just so everybody's on the same page about what a strategic plan is, sometimes there's confusion around this. So we're not telling you this to say that you don't understand, but um, just so everybody's got the same definition of what it is. It really defines the what. It defines the what and where you're trying to go as a community, as a city government. Uh, where, 
what do you want to become as a community? What, what do you want to improve in your city organization? What are the priorities you're gonna focus on to achieve a shared vision? Um, and then how are we going to be able to measure and evaluate the city's progress in moving towards that vision? We think of it um, and, and really treat it as a living document so that it can not sit on a shelf, but guide your decision-making, guide your budget, guide your long-range capital investments, guide your economic and community development efforts, guide how you organize and uh, deliver your city services. And then it's a great tool for government transparency and accountability. It's a, a wonderful way, if you have a, an articulated strategy, to then be able to communicate to the, the um, residents of your community the impacts that you're making and how it is that you're making progress towards a future that everyone wants for Capitola. We also help, will help um, the city with an implementation plan so it can be successful um, with its strategic plan, but we do that after the strategic plan is fully developed and has been adopted um, by you as a council. So I mentioned the environmental scan and how important community engagement is. So the community engagement and, and some other um, data gathering that we do really is how we build that environmental scan. And, and it, it presents the current and anticipated events that are gonna be happening, um, their relationships um, within your organization internally and with all of your external environments. And then it's the basis of determining the future direction of the organization and the areas of focus that you're going to be paying attention to. Um, so we wanna look at opportunities, challenges, trends. We wanna make sure that everyone who's involved in the strategic planning process has a shared understanding of the current environment and what the opportunities are. And then again, we're working with that environmental scan to help you as city leaders navigate those different things that we're going to identify um, that come out of the community engagement process. We have a facilitation methodology that works very well for these processes. It's very, it's structured, but it's also flexible and it has lots of tools associated with it. Not, we don't ever use all of them on any single project, but what it does is it helps to provide a clear intention and a way of aligning different groups of people around some shared ideas. And so you can reach consensus about what it is that you want to do. This facilitation methodology was developed about 40 years ago. Its purpose is community building. Um, our team members are certified in this methodology and it's designed to, to really emphasize those things that are in the, the, the five circles there. Um, and so we'll be bringing that methodology, um, customizing it and applying it to your process. Maddie, I think this is where you come in. <laughs> Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh -huh. So here you, you will see the project approach and plan development. So there's three key elements to this. It is city council, what is city council doing? What is city staff and leadership doing? And what is the community's um, impacts. So for city council, it really is to develop what is the mission, the vision, the core values, or the guiding principles, and their strategic priorities and goals. What does that look like? For city staff and leadership, it is refining the council's work, developing strategic objectives, and performance measures, and the implementation plan, and making this actionable based on the, your council and the vision. And then the, the Capitola community, what is their role? Their role really is identify priorities um, for the city to focus on, as well as help to create this, the, the vision moving forward. So some of the key project activities, we have community and staff engagement. This includes a social pinpoint site, which is a web-based um, landing page site that's a mobile, desktop, and tablet friendly. We have a community survey, We've interviews with focus groups including community leaders and elected officials. We have interviews with staff as well as a, a virtual community workshop. Plan development sessions this with city council and leadership and staff. And then a final strategic plan. The final plan will be graphically designed, beautiful visual plan that, ever, that you can share um, out to everyone and that can be a tangible takeaway from what we've created for the strategic plan.
What sources inform the strategic plan? So this is the information and the various sources that we um, work with you all as well as the community to put together um, these ideas and identify these priorities. So some of these elements are the interviews with community uh, members as well as the community workshop, that social pinpoint community engagement platform, the community survey results, existing demographic and economic data, what data already exists and we pull that, as well as the current existing city plans, what is already happening and what do we have to take into um, a impact? What, what impact do we have to take into consideration for the current environment? So when we talk about mission, vision, guiding principles, and strategic priorities, these are those four elements of the strategic plan. And what are they? So the mission is what you do now, for whom, and how do you do it? The vision is where are you going? What does the next five years look like? What is that um, future that you want to achieve for the community? Then we have the guiding principles and how does the um, organization carry out its mission and how does it really interact with the community? What does that work look like? And then strategic priorities. What are the four to five areas that you want to focus on to achieve that vision and moving forward? This is one of um, my favorite um, slides to show because it really shows how everything works together. So if you're looking at it like a house, the vision is at the top and then the mission comes underneath and then each of those strategic priorities, the goal statements that are associated with the, associated with the strategic priorities, and then very hard to see here, but this says objective and then also measure. So these are the tangible actions that you take in order to ob obtain each of these strategic priorities. And then at the bottom um, really is that foundation is those guiding principles. What are those core values and those core ideals um, that make you be able to do all of the work? This is our current approach to the project timeline. Our typical strategic plans last anywhere from six to 12 months. And currently, as we are in phase one in project planning, we are um, started off just last month in January. And um, it goes right now, it goes through September of 2024 with that final um, graphically designed adopted strategic plan. And with that, I will turn it back over to council. Any questions or comments? Thank you so much. Any questions? No, no questions? Questions? No? Okay. Uh, we Thank will you. bring it out it to you. It's nice to get a chance to uh, let you know um, how we're going to do this work. And we'll be engaging with you soon um, through conversations and interviews that we'll be having with, with you as elected officials, as well as many, many others inside the city and around um, your community. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We're really grateful for your presentation tonight. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great night. Take care. We'll bring it out to public comment on this item. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Uh, there's no vote on this, so we're just receiving the report. Is there any further comments? Seeing none, that brings us to the end of the meeting. So we will adjourn to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting on February 22nd at 6 p.m. Until then, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.